I'm going to share my screen. Everybody should see my Chrome browser up. And we're going to start talking about functions. So last week, we introduced the concept of reusability. Because I could write a block of code, and it could be in a loop, and that block of code could be run as many times as that loop was, was hit, as many times as there were iterations for that loop. And that's great. But how great would it be if we could take that block of code and give it a name and only ever write it once? So if we wanted to use it in different loops or in different places in the code, we'd only ever have to refer to that name. And that's what a function is. It is the ability to name a block of code and use that block of code by its name. So we've already understood about like naming variables. So a variable is a name, is a named space in memory where we keep a piece of data. We can keep an integer, float, string, boolean, but we get to name it. And it, it's very powerful as we have seen up through the fourth week of this class. It's all about the variable. We name it, we put things in it, we, write, we read from it, we create new variables from it. A function takes that concept and now puts it into the ability to name a block of code. So instead of just a single integer, instead of, you know, having my int equal 1, now we can name a function. And let's say that function is to print the instructions for your game. Okay? Or in module 6, it is to you know, print a set of instructions. So that's what a function can do. You can put all of the, the instructions for your game into a single function. You can call it instructions. And then when you want to use it, you just use that name. You don't have to have this huge extra block of code. And that's really important for a couple of reasons. Functions are important for a couple of reasons. First, you don't want to ever have to write code and repeat it. Okay, the last thing you want to do as a programmer is to take a block of code, copy it to someplace else because you've got to use it again in another place in your code. That increases complexity, increases the number of lines of code, increases the difficulty of maintenance. None of those are good. Those are all bad. Because what you want to be able to do when you write programs for a living is you want to be able to read your code. You want to be able to reuse as much code as possible so that you have less code to maintain. Because maintainability is a cost. We think about writing programs as the cost. But there is equally as much cost, if not more sometimes, in maintaining large, co large code bases. The code base I work on is over a million lines of code. Now, I'm not the only programmer that works on that. We have, we have several people, and they're very smart, and they're very good. Um, so it's important for us, the programming team I'm on, to write code that is reusable and well encapsulated. And functions are what allow us to do that. Functions are the thing that allows me to take a process and put it into a named block and then reuse that block. It really is very handy. So now I'll, I'll get off my soapbox about functions and I'll talk about user-defined functions and what are the basics. So basically, you define a function and then you call a function. Those are the two things. The function definition is those blocks of code and its name. The call is when you use that name. Now, we already have been using functions from day one in this class. Print is a function. Input is a function. Those functions are given to us by Python. So Python says, here you go. 
I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff. And Python gives us a whole bunch of stuff, stuff that we won't even touch on in this class. Um, so we get that already. Those are things that somebody, the people who write the programming language Python have thought were useful and give it to us for free. Now we're going to learn how we can do the same thing. So we can do it by some syntax and another keyword. So we get this new keyword called death. Okay, It's a keyword just like if is a keyword, just like uh, else is a keyword, just like for and while are keyler, keywords. Death is just another keyword. And what death tells Python is it says, OK, Python, I'm about to define something. And this then, then every time I use the name of this thing I'm about to define, you come back here and you run these, blocks, these lines of code. That's what you do. And, and that's what it tells Python. So Python kind of reads those blocks of codes and stores them stores them away and says this is the name. So every time I hit this name, I'm going to come back and run these lines of code. And that's very handy. It's very, very handy and very, very useful. So how do I define a function? Well, let's take a look. Uh, I'm going to define a new Python file, simple func. Okay, so let me just make, come on, where's my cursor? All right, there we go. So I've just defined something called simple func, and I'm going to define a function after, of course, I tell it where my interpreter is. Okay. So I'm going to define a function. I'm going to use this new keyword, def, and I'm going to say simple. Actually, I'm going to say instructions is going to be my function. And that's the beginning part of it. Now, as part of the syntax, as part of every function definition, you have to have an open and close parenthesis, and it has to end with a colon. If you don't do those things, Python's going to give you an error message. And I'll take away some of those things, and we'll see what the error messages are in a minute. So now I've just defined a function, but there's nothing in the function. So there's a definition, and then there's the code that's in the function. Because remember I said a function is a name for a block of code. So if I am going, like, let's say I'm going to do this for my instructions. So I'm going to print the instructions are turn right. These are just, those are nonsensical instructions and that's okay. Turn left. Whatever the instructions are. You can throw whatever instructions you want in there. Now, that's the first part. I just defined a function, okay? I used the def keyword. I gave it a name instructions. That's all this is. That's a name. I could have put the letter A, and it would have been just fine, too. There are naming conventions that you have to follow with Python. Like, it has to start with a letter. Um, you can't have special characters in it. But other than that, I can pretty much name it how I want. And then I put my parentheses. Whoops, I did not mean to do that. Okay, then I put my parentheses, and then I put the colon. Without the colon, Python doesn't know that this is the end of my definition for my function name. And then I give it some instructions. Now, what would happen if I just ran this right now? Because I have Python code in there. So let us go and do that. Oops, there we go. So I'm just going to run this. Nothing happened. It didn't print a thing. 
Well, but I have three print statements in here. They're right here. So why didn't this print? Why did nothing print? That's because Python, the only thing Python did with these four lines of code is it said, oh, okay, I now have this thing called instructions. And when somebody uses the instructions in the right syntax, I'm going to do print these three lines. But we have not told Python to use instructions yet. So how do I tell Python to use, or in programming terms, to call the instructions function? Well, I use the name, just like that. Instructions, open, close, parenthesis. Now, in a minute, we'll get to things that can go inside the parenthesis. But for right now, this is, this is all you need to know for right at this minute. I'm going to say instructions and call. So by adding line seven, let's see what happens. I now have printed my three lines of instructions. So here I define it, here I call it. And without both of those, this doesn't work. Because if I just call instructions and I don't have that, I get name, error name instructions is not defined. Okay, let's see what the question is. Okay, you don't need to answer this right now, along with what you're talking about. When writing my pseudocode for my game, should I have in the beginning a def function for the directions, or should I have that for the actual code? Right now I have, at the start of my pseudocode, display welcome to text adventure game, display collect six items to win the game and escape. Um, the, if the rubric does not say that you have to have a function, and that's what I'm not sure of. I don't know the rubric off the top of my head. If the rubric says that you need to have a function defined for your instructions, then yes, you will need a def for your service code. I can go back out and take a look at that. Remind me at the end of this lecture, and I will log in, and I will um, take a quick look and see what the rubric says, because your instructor should be grading to the rubric. So we need to go back and look at the rubric instructions. I know in my class, if you put a, if you just go to the next step and put def and then define the function. I'm happy with that, but I can't tell you how, because there's nothing in the rubric that says do it or don't do it, as far as I remember. But I can't answer for how another instructor acts when you do that, so I need to go look at the rubric. Does that work, Valerie? So that was Valerie, yeah. Does that work, Valerie? Okay. Okay, so we now see that you need both parts. You need this part, which is the definition, and you need this part, which is the call, for everything to work. Now, in this example, you're like, well, why didn't I just print out those three statements? Well, because maybe you want to use this in multiple places. Maybe you have other functions that want to call this function. Maybe you're using this in a while loop and you don't want to clutter up your while loop with what might be 20 lines of, of print statements. Okay? So there are lots of reasons why you want to use a function. Reusability, readability, when I'm, when I'm designing my code, because that's kind of where functions start to come in, I take a look at what the logical breakup is for the code. And some of that's experience, and some of that's just my style of code, and some of that I go talk to my colleagues, and I'm like, yeah, well, I'm kind of thinking about this. So there's lots of reasons why you create a function. So. Let's keep going and take a look at 
Um, this is just basic function output. Parameters. Okay, so remember those parentheses? I said we'd get back to what goes into a parenthesis. One of the things that really is, is very powerful is to create your code so it's driven by the data. And if we're looking at a function, sometimes we want to actually use data in that function to change the potential outcome. So let me do an example. Let's just do rectangle. Okay? So I have a rectangle. Let's say I want to I want to I want to calculate the area of a rectangle. So I'm going to define area and I'm going to say return. So what do I need for an area? I need the length and the width. So I want to multiply a length times a width. And the only function of this area, the, the only purpose of the area function is to do this calculation. Now, this is going to be a simple calculation. But think if you were doing this from a mathematics standpoint or an engineering standpoint and you have a very complex function and you want to reuse that function when somebody enters whatever they're going to enter for that function. So area is going to be very simple, but this idea and concept can be expanded. So to define an area, we do length times width. Okay? Now, how do I how do I get that? How do I get information into my function so I can just multiply length times width two times? Well, I can define what's called a parameter. And a parameter is simply a positional name place for a variable. It's just a holder. Okay, so I'm going to name one parameter length and one parameter width. Okay? And then what I want to do is I want to return, and we'll talk about return in a second, length times width. So that's how the area is going to be calculated. So what did I just do? Well, I defined two variables. Length is a variable and width is a variable. But length and width only exist for those two lines. Well, three is a, a comment. So technically, length and width only exists for line four. It doesn't exist outside of line four unless I define it outside of line four. So what have I done here? I have defined a function. I've named my function area. I have defined two variables for that function that are going to basically, they're just buckets. And I'm going to be able to use those buckets in a function call to pass data in to the area function. And then I'm going to return length and width. Well, let me, let me get back to this in a minute. We'll just print for right now. Okie dokie. That should do us. So I've just did, done the definition. I've created something called area. I've given it a print statement. And I've defined these two things that we haven't really played with much yet. So now I'm going to call area. So I know how to call area because I just used the word area. But now I have this length and width in there. So I'm going to say the length is 10 and the width is 20. Okay, and what's going to happen, sorry about that, is I'm going to get a print statement out. But let's do a little bit, come on, oh, sorry, wrong one. Let's do a little bit of debugging for just a second. So let me change this. 
So I'm going to debug this. I want to, I want you to see what happens in the debugger because I think it's important to understand how Python works. So Python, you'll see we haven't, we didn't, we, we put a breakpoint at line four, but we didn't stop at line four. Where we stopped is at line seven because right now Python, the only line it has to work on is line seven. We have defined lines two through five, but Python can't do anything with them because they're inside the function definition. So the first thing that happens is it stops at this line area because that's a code, that's a line of code that it can run. And it's now waiting to do something. So I am now, usually you, hear, you see me step over lines of code. This time I'm going to step in, okay? This step into is going to actually take me from line seven to line four because now I am inside the function. So I have told Python when I stepped into it to go to the first executable line of code in the function area. And so the first executable line of code is this, the area is, and to print it out. Now, let's look at a few more things here. If I look up here in PyCharm, this is one of the reasons I like PyCharm, is I've got length 10 and width 20. Also, if I look down here under variables, down here at the bottom of the screen, I have length equals int 10 and width equals int 20. By calling area with 10 and 20, I've actually set the value of the variable length to 10 and the value of the variable width to 20. That's all the stuff, that's a lot of stuff, that's all the stuff that happened in on line 7 with, you know, 20 characters, 25 characters. Um, pretty powerful stuff. So I am now going to print the area, which is length and width. And you can, that's the other nice thing about PyCharm. I can sit here and I can just mouse over length and see that it's 10 and mouse over width and see that it's 20. So if I step over the print function, I'm going to go to the console. It says the area is 200. I am now back to line 7. Our blue line that says where I'm running is back to line 7 because I printed something out. Python had to go back to some place that it was running. So it went back to line 7, and now it's going to end. Well, that's fine, but I could have just put this in place of 7. Yeah, you could have. But the nice thing here is that I can call this as many times as I want with different function with different values. 42. I'm just putting values in here. 0 0. So the nice thing about this is when I run it, all I did is change the values. The code in here remains the same and I will get different output. Now, I said I would um, talk about the return. Let me go. Let me double check here. Make sure I got everything I want. So those are function parameters. Okay. Um, returning values is next. So I can calculate all kinds of cool stuff in functions. The my, my little thing of area. Um, is is just the beginning. So what if I didn't want to print anything from here? What if I just wanted to return a calculation? Let's say I have this very complex calculation that I do. I'm not very good at math, so um, I have the option of returning information from a function. So that basically says, take whatever I give you and send it back to the caller. So let's, let's look at this. I'm 
just going to do this, and I'll change those A1s to different numbers. Okay. So now, instead of printing, I just commented that out, I'm going to return the results of the calculation, which is length times width. And I can simply do this. Right now you're not going to see anything printed out because I took the print statement away. But what I can do is I can do something here. Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four. I did five, right? Okay. Oh, I only went to A4. One, two, three, four. Okay. A1, A2, A3. Okay. So when I run this, I'll see 216, 37, 38, and 0. But let's stop and do this in the debugger. And actually, let me do this um, to make it a little bit easier to see. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I've got a breakpoint on line 8, and then I'm going to put a breakpoint on line 5. So the first executable line of code that Python will get to is line 8. We already know that none of these are executable lines that Python will do anything with until somebody calls area. So 8 is the first one where it's going to stop. So I'm going to debug. We know that it gets to 8. So now I'm going to step in. And when I step in, we'll see that length is 10 and width is 20. And I've got this variable here called retval. And I'm going to say length times width. I'm going to step over. Retval is now 200. And now I've got this return statement. Well, what does return do? What return does is it takes the value that I've calculated and put in retval, which right now is 200, and it makes it available to the line that called the code, called the function. So it's making it available to line 8. And I can do a couple of things with it. Usually when a, something returns, I put it into a variable. And that's what this does. So I'm saying variable A1, I am assigning you the return from area. So whatever's returned from that, put it in variable called A1. And I can do that here with A2, and I can do it with A3 and A4 and A99 if I want. So when I step over the return, I come back to 8 because I started at 8, area ran, and I come back to 8. And then what happens? If I step over, you'll see that A1 is 200. And if I do this again, I'm going to step over. I'm now at 16. Step over, A2 is 16. And so you get the picture. I'm just calculating and returning and calculating and returning and calculating and returning, and then I'm going to print. So this is a simplistic example, but it shows you the power of functions. Because imagine, imagine you're an engineer, and you have complex mathematical calculation you have to do. And that complex mathematical calculation takes 50 lines of code. We don't want to rewrite 50 lines of code every time you want to put in a new value and test it out in that mathematical function. And this is the way you avoid that in Python. 
I use functions all the time. All the time. This is something if you're going to program that you want to get used to. It's very handy. Okay. So those are return statements. Uh, okay. This is just saying they're talking about hierarchical function calls. You can nest a function call. You can nest a function within another function. So you can have a function and it can call another function. The function just has to be defined first. So you can't call something that hasn't been defined. So if I'm here and um, let's say I'm going to say output area. Okay? And that's going to be I'm just going to put A there because I'm not really doing good namings and I'm going to print there it is format A okay A okay so all fine and good I just defined another function it's going to say print area so if I did this here and I said print, I'm oh, sorry, output, output area, I wonder what would happen. So let's run it and see. Okay. It basically, I don't know why PyCharm did that. I should have gotten an area. Uh, 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 um, an error that it hadn't been defined yet. I wonder if it's a version, some version. Anyway, this is the way it should have been. Um, so you, all right, let's go back. Sorry. Nested function calls, or what they're calling hierarchical function calls. I have a function that's defined as area. I can call another function from inside of it. So you can do that. You can put if and else. You can call functions. You can have all everything we've done up till this point you can do inside of a function. Or you can use to determine a function call. Oh, I'm glad it's making sense to you, Valerie. Uh, let's see. Dynamic typing. So there are strongly typed and weakly typed languages. Strongly typed languages basically is like C++ and Java. You have to tell it what type the variable is going to be before you define it. You have to define, you have to say it's going to be an integer or it's going to be a string. Uh, in Python, we don't have to do that. In Python, we just do it and Python figures it out for us. I don't have a keyword called string. It just is a string. That means that Python does what's called dynamic typing, which means it tries to figure out the type for you. And that's all fine and good. However, if you, you might get some results that you're not expecting, or you might get errors that you're not expecting. So let's do this. Let's go back to area. And let me just make this one A and B. Sorry, let's do this. Let's make them A, 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 B, B, B. Let's see what happens when I run this. I'm just going to run it, and I have all of a sudden an issue. And it says I can't multiply sequence by non-int or of type stir. Well, what in the world just happened? So, because Python is dynamically typed, it doesn't, at the time that I write it, tell me that there is a problem. Okay? I'm using the multipli multiplication sign here. You can't multiply strings in Python. You just can't. It's just the way it is. So 
But Python didn't tell me I couldn't. Python didn't stop and say, hey, wait a minute, you're not allowed to pass a string to your area function. And that's because Python doesn't care. Python is dynamically typed. It assumes that you know what types are supposed to be passed. And it's not going to try and stop you. The only time it will stop you is if it gets to something that it absolutely can't do. And in this case, it got to a multiplication point. So let's do something different. Let's define add it up. And I'm going to say x and y. Don't ever use these, these variable names because they're horrible. So I'm going to print uh, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to return x x plus y and is that what I want to do? Actually I'm going to say val equals, I'll just do it straight here in the function. And then I'm going to print val. Okay. So let's see what happens instead of this, I'm going to add it up. Add it up. I'm just going to change it for two of them. Except I have to spell it right. So I've now just made this add it up function. So let's see what happens when I run it now. Well, that's interesting because in add it up, when I pass 10 and 20, I get the result of 30. When I pass AAABBB, I get the result of AAABBB. That is, again, the result of dynamic typing. I'm allowed to add strings together. We talked about that in the first week, string concatenation. I'm allowed to add integers together because it's math. So what I have is I have a function that can handle multiple types. That's dynamic typing. So dynamic typing assumes that you know what you're passing in, and Python will do whatever it can to execute that line of code given what you've put in. Area, because it's using multiplication, will give you an error because you can't multiply strings if you use AAA and BBB. However, add it up, which uses addition, will allow you to add strings. So you can use add it up for strings or integers or floats. So that is what dynamic typing is. And it's very handy. It can also drive you crazy. We've already talked about a lot of reasons for defining functions. Reusability, improving the readability of code, and if you think that readability isn't an issue, write a complex, write a complex set of code and go back six months later and read through it when you've been doing other things for the six months. And then you'll realize how important read readability is in code. Comments are important but there are other things than comments that make code readable. Uh, modular development, they did mention that up here. And basically what modular development does is it means you can, you can divide and conquer with a program. And you really do want to break your, your program and the, the problem that you're trying to solve with the program into its component parts and put as many of those component parts into individual functions as possible. Okay, stubbing. Stubbing is a common practice, and basically what it means is that, let's say I'm working on some of the code and you're working on some of the code, so, because we've got a lot of code to write. But my code needs to call your code, but you haven't finished your code yet. So, is that going to keep me from um, writing my code? It doesn't have to. What you can do is you can define what they call stubs. So you and I agree on what 
the function name is going to be and what the parameters are going to be and the order of parameters because order is important. And then I go off and I write some stubs because I know I'm going to pass in both strings and integers and floats into my added up function. You haven't written added up yet. I can then stub it out and return canned data, just just easy data that's just going to be returned that doesn't do a lot. Now, it kind of makes no sense when you're talking about this little added up function that I wrote. However, when you're talking about complex functions or you're talking about things like accessing databases, data mining, anything where you've got a lot of stuff coming back, I just want to test my functionality. I don't necessarily need it to be hooked up to that big database that you're mining. So I can stub out the functions, and basically they're dummies that, that just return certain data that we know we're going to want to see so I can test my code. That's all that a function stub is. Know that it's out there, and that if you get into programming, you're going to be writing stubs. You can branch and loop. In fact, functions and branches and looping is a lot of what I do on a given day. Um, and so you will want to, when you're writing especially complex functions, you're going to put if-else statements. You can put a while loop in a function. Anything we've done so far and will do moving forward can be done in a function. Everything. Okay, functions are objects. And this is important when we start to talk about object-oriented at the end of the class. But basically, a function is encapsulated code. What do I mean by that? I mean by that that we have taken some number of lines of code, we've given it a name, and we've drawn a box around it. And you can think of that box as having one way in and one way out. The one way in is through the function call, and the one way out is through the return. And anything that happens inside that box that we have defined is what the function does. And it can be considered a black box oftentimes. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go back and think about the print function that we've used from the beginning of class. Have we actually seen the code in the print, in Python's print function? I've never actually seen it. I've never gone and looked for it. I probably could find it if I did. But I've never actually looked at the code inside the print function. Why haven't I done it? Well, because it works. I don't need to go in and look at it. I know that I need to pass some things to it and that on the uh, once I've called it with the appropriate parameters, it's going to do something. I don't need to know how it does it. It does it. It does it well. And Python has called it print, and it's drawn a black box around it. So that is why a function is an object. I can use the word print, parentheses, whatever I want in the parentheses, and it will get printed to the console. And it's, it's like a box, and, that, and that's what they're talking about here. Um, common errors. All kinds of common errors with a function. So let's go down and look at some errors. Okay, I've got my three functions here, okay? Well, let me, let me create the first common error. The first common error is that, okay? So if I run this guy, I'm going to, you don't even get to this, for, you don't even get to, to, to line 15. It won't. It, you, all of a sudden there's an indentation error. Expected an indentation, an indented block. That's because, just like with if statements and while loops, you've got to indent properly. The def function says, I'm creating a block of code that has a, a name. The name is output area. I'm taking a parameter. I'm going to call it A. 
and then I'm going to give you some number of lines of code. Well, I didn't give it any lines of code right now because two is left justified under the def. So Python says, you didn't give me any lines of code. How does Python know you're giving it lines of code? Because you've indented at least one. Okay? The other thing you can't do, and I've seen people do this, is this. Okay, so let's see what happens when I run it. I didn't get an error. I should have gotten an error. I don't know why it didn't give me an error. You shouldn't be able to do that. That's a bad anyway. I don't know why Python didn't give me an error, but don't do that. It won't work like you think it will. Um... Let's see where the other common errors they're talking about. Uh, uh, missing a return statement. Yeah. If you're trying to figure out, so, if I just run it now, you'll see that none, 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 none here. And that's because I didn't return anything. So here, uh, okay, sorry, add it up. Now that I, I, I saw the none and the none here, and that's because I changed it to add it up, and I didn't return anything from add it up. So my output wasn't the way I wanted it to be. So now I get 30 AAABBB. And then 37, 38, and 0. Okay. Scope and functions. We haven't really talked a lot about scope in this class, but scope is very important. In all programming languages, scope is important. And scope just answers the question, where does this value exist? Where does it live? And Python has a couple of different scopes. Usually we work in the global scope up until this point, up until really we started to do if and then looping. Everything pretty much lived in the global scope. And most of what we have still lives in the global scope. But there are other, um, and, and the global scope is just the whole program. That's all it is. When I say global scope, I just mean everything in the program. But when we start to get into functions, we start to look at where does a variable really live. Okay? So let me do this and I'll show you. So I have a 1, a 2, a 3, and a 4 here, right? And I have val here and I have rec val. What would happen down here if I wanted to print red val? Let's see what would happen. Already Py PyCharm is telling you something. It can't find red val. Even though you got it right up here, you can't find red val. Well, why can't you find red val? Because red val doesn't exist. So it says red val is not defined. And that's because here, red val is in the scope of the area function. Nobody else knows about it. Don't know about it here. I don't know about it here. I wouldn't know about it in output area. I don't know about it. Python doesn't know about it because it was defined in the block of code that is in the area function and nobody else has access to that. Nobody else. So that's what we mean by scope. Who has access to that variable name so that they can get the value? And right now, the only the only thing the only object that has the access to the value in retval is the area function this won't work got an error from it this won't work got an error from it same with val val is the same way so that's what scoping is who has access and 
for something defined inside the function, for a variable created inside the function, and that includes the parameters, you are not going to have access to it outside that function. So this stuff is inside the function. This stuff is outside the function. So that's what scope means. So if you start to see weird errors where you think that something is defined, you're looking at it, but make sure that what you're looking at is not inside the function if you are trying to access it from the global scope or outside the function. Namespaces and scope resolution. So um, they're talking about namespace maps and how to resolve names. Um, and this is just more about scoping. If you follow the general rules of scoping, you don't need to worry about locals and globals, okay? You can do that, they're, they're handy, but if you, you don't have to worry about Python telling you how to get at the scope of a variable if you understand the fact when you define the variable. If you understand that this is in the global scope, you're good. If you understand that this is in a function scope, that you're good. It's when you combine the two or you name variables that things can get confusing. So if I had a retval variable, let's say I just define retval up here. Okay, so now I've just defined something in the global scope that is also in the local scope. Shadows name retval from outer scope. That is what PyCharm is telling me and that's because it's bad to do that. You don't want to mix something that is in the outer scope with something that is in the inner scope. So you have to be careful with variable naming because it'll mess you up. Values will not be what you expect. Okie dokie. Function arguments and mutability. Um, so we talked about parameters. One thing I didn't mention was that, um, let's see, how do I want to put that? So one thing I wanted to mention was that function parameters are positional. So 10, sorry, length is the name of the special variable I've created for the area function. When I call area down here with 42, 42 will always be length and 89 will always be width because this is the first argument and this is the first variable. This is the second argument and this is the second parameter. So they're positional, one, two, three, four. Okay, or in this case, one and two. So 42 becomes length, 89 becomes width, because 42 is the thing that I put in first, and 89 is the value I put in second. So they are positional, and there, for the most part, there has to be a one-to-one -one mapping. So if I decided to just call a five equal area, with no parameters, let's see what happens. Uh, right here, I get type error. Area is missing two required optional positional arguments, length and width. So let's say I put one here, and I run it again, and I now get another message that it's missing one required positional argument width. So that tells me that I need to have two arguments there. Um, default parameter values, a nice segue. 
So I just told you that I have to I, I have two parameters defined here, and I have to ha that means I have to have two arguments, two values here. Well, not necessarily. I can have what they call a default value. Am I doing that right? Yeah. So what I can do is I can say, if somebody doesn't bother to put in length, make it a zero. If somebody doesn't bother to put in width, make it a zero. Well, that's all fine and good, but how do you know? Okay, because they're positional, if I call this with just one, it will always be one for the length. So let's do this. Oops. Let's do this. Continue. Okay, so here I am. I am, okay, I'm not there yet. Two. So this is the call that I'm at right here. And I have a length of one and a width of zero. Because these are, because parameters and arguments are positional, if I pass in one here, it's automatically going to go to length because it's the first one. There's no way to make length zero and width one without explicitly telling it that. So if I only pass one here, oh, let me back up, sorry. What I've done, I didn't do that, I apologize. What I've done by adding equal zero here, or could have been equal 10, or could have been equal 42, is giving, telling Python that if somebody doesn't pass a value in, then I want length zero and width to be zero. And it also says that if somebody passes in one argument, length becomes that argument and width will be zero. So that's what I've done by setting a zero equal here or a zero equal there. Now, note, I could have been, I could have made this 42 and 10. The values don't matter, except for the fact that they have to be integers. They have to be a mathematical value because that's a multiplication. So I've just made my code actually a little bit more functional, a little bit more useful, because maybe I just want to call area and get the standard area. And whoops. Stop it and run it. And maybe print area. Area is 420. That is because of this. Sorry, of this because I said 42 times 10. Now, if I wanted to put 10 there, I would get 100 in that respect. If I wanted to put 100 and 100, then it's just like a normal function call and they all get replaced. This only becomes 42 if I don't pass anything. This only becomes 10 if I don't have any arguments or I have only one argument. So um, the positionality and the default parameters go hand in hand. All right. So are there any challenges? Arbitrary argument list. I don't think you're going to have to do an arbitrary argument list in this class, but it's good to understand what they are. And that's basically just saying when you do a certain notation, you can have as many parameters as you want, okay? Just it could be a long list of them if you want. It could be a sentence if you want. Um, it could be a dictionary. So you can, can set it up to have a variable number of arguments. You can also return more than one value from a function. And it's going to come in handy in one of the challenges, or one of the labs. 
So how do you return multiple things from a function? Well, let me create a new file. We'll call it multi-return. And I will just make a function multi um, a, b. Return, I don't know, uh, rep one is going to be top of my head is a plus b. And I can return both of these. And I can call it like this. I can say retval equals multi 10, 22, retval. One equals multi, comma, BBB. Oops, BBB. And then I can print. And this is dynamic typing and multiple arguments all in one. Print ret valve. Sorry, my bad. Red bow A, red bow B. My bad. It was. And we'll just do it once. Sorry about that. So we're returning multiple things. And this is something pretty unique to Python. I don't work with any other languages that actually do this, that allows you to return multiple values from a function without having to put them into some kind of a data structure. So let's do this real quick. I know I'm going over and I apologize. Okay. Come on. There we go. So what this basically says is Just debug it, and I'll do this real quick. So I I have red val a red val b equals multi ten twenty two. So I'm going to step into this, and I'm going to say ten and twenty two. Oh, I stepped over. My bad. And what we'll see is we will see that red val did I finish? I didn't think I did. Sorry, what was the comment? Okay, I know it's going over a little bit, but I do have a question regarding the lab, specifically in how some of the input is for when we attempt submission to the labs. It's causing me some issues with the code. Okay, we can take a look at that really quick. I will, um, I'll leave the multi stuff to you guys. Um, just finish it. Oh. Oh, yeah, my bad. Format A comma B and A plus B. That was my bad. So we'll just run this. Just to make sure it's correct before I put it up tomorrow. No, nope. int object. Okay. Yeah, I'm not doing good right now. Okay, much better. So you can return multiple things. It's something that most other programs can't do, and you're going to need it for one of the labs. So um, doc strings, don't worry about it. Some engineering examples are really fun. 
So what labs are causing you the issue, Valerie? Or um, sorry, Elijah. What labs are causing you the issue? So we can go take a look at them. By the way, you can unmute if you want, and we can just talk. Um, so both labs for this week are having a similar issue. Um, I'm looking okay. at uh, 5.18 right now. Um, okay. My issue is um, when we're in develop mode and it has us enter input, it has us put it yeah. in as two separate inputs, um, like two separate numbers. Uh-huh which is how I developed my code, and it worked fine doing that. Whenever I go over to submit, it passes the first test with the input being similar to how it is in the develop mode. And then it also yeah. provides a different style of input, um, which I will put in a comment. And that's where I'm getting confused is how to take the type of input they're giving me um, to work with the code. Okay, so the swap values minus one comma ten is what they're giving you. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so what they're trying to do is they're trying to call a function called swap values with the value minus one and ten. So you should have defined a function called swap underscore values and it should swap the values and return them in the swapped order. Is that what you did? Correct. And in the um, instructions, it specified it want us, wanted us to define the function as swap values with um, the parameters of user value 1, comma user value 2, which and is that's fine. how I set it up. And that's fine. And then you want, because what Zybooks is trying to do is it's trying to um, call your defined function. Does that make sense? Yes and no. Could you elaborate on how like, I should set that up then? Well, here. So you defined a function called swap values, right? And then under here, if name main, you actually are calling swap values, correct? Yes. Okay. And um, when you created it, you created it. I'm sorry, I think I have a critter in my attic. Anyway, I'll have to go figure that out. Um, so you define something called swap values. What is, what is iBooks telling you in submit mode? It's not giving me any feedback for the test that it does with the values set up that way. It's only giving me feedback for the traditional input, um, like how it is in develop mode. So it's not giving me any kind of input at all. Is it just telling you that it's an error? No, it's not even doing that. It's just saying that I get zero out of two points for that particular test with no feedback on what did or didn't go right with the function. Is it only one of the tests, or is it all of the tests in submit mode? So it's passing one of the tests and, and failing the other three. OK. I would need to look at your code. Um, and you're not in my class, are you? No. OK. I can't really offer to take a look at your code because you're in another class. I don't want to step on another teacher's toes. Sorry. They get picky. But um, 
Yeah. I'm sorry I can't be more help, Elijah, with that one. Um, if you were my student, I would say send me a screen capture and I'll tell you what's going on. Um, but I don't know, unless your instructor is comfortable with you doing that, if they say you're comfortable, if you check and, you know, your instructor says, yeah, you can go show it to her, then please send it to me and I'll figure it out, okay? Okay. How does that work? Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. Okay, so double check with your professor. If your professor says fine, if your professor says no, then don't. What I want you to do then is I want you to take a screen capture of your code, okay, and a screen capture of what's happening in submit mode and send me those screen captures, all right? Okay. If your instructor is not happy, then please don't send them, okay? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So exact change. I just wanted to talk about this one really quick. So you've done this one before. You just haven't done it as a function. I think it was in module three. This is where you had to figure out the number of quarters, number of dollars, number of dimes, all of that. Now they want you to put that in a function. Do not start new here. Okay, go back to module three, find all of the, what you did and all the different floor operators, and then put that into your function and add the, the new stuff, add the return and things like that. So that's all I wanted to say about this one. You've done, the, you've done a lot of the work on this. The only thing you have to do is get that code that you've already written, and it's your code, and then put it here, put it into a function, make it a function, and then do the correct returns, okay? And then finish out what they want. So they want the actual calculation in a function, and then they want the output outside of the function. So where you're doing all of those print statements and the if statements and stuff, you want that in the main part of um, your code and the function is defined up here with the actual, sorry, the function will be defined up here with the actual calculations in it, if that makes any sense. So I think that's it for tonight, unless anybody has any other questions. So I'm going to uh, call it a night. And I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to stop the recording.